Hello. All right. It's 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time here in New York, and hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in our 2016 webinar series, specifically on the subject of managing water for food security. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. When I'm not doing this, I work with the Engineering for Change as the director of our program. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit more about today's webinar. Today, nearly a billion people worldwide lack access to enough nutritious food to lead healthy and active lives. These food insecure people are also often lacking enough readily available water to meet their needs. Ensuring sustainable global food and water security is an urgent challenge, especially as populations and incomes continue to increase, climate changes, and demand for water resources continues to grow. So we invited Roberto Lenton, the founding executive director of the Water for Food Institute at the University of Nebraska, to share his insights on the water food nexus and introduce some practical ways to improve water use and management in agricultural and food systems. And we'd like to welcome you, Roberto, and thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to give a shout out to the E4C webinar series team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make recommendations for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the team via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge exchange platform and global community of nearly 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. This can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides call-free access to relevant and current news, professional development resourcing, resources, including jobs and fellowships, and a growing database of hundreds of field-tested products in our solutions library. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we will be able to serve you resources that meet your needs and interests. We invite you to join our passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Check out our website and learn more to sign up. Now, the webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. The webinar series is a free, publicly available series showcasing the best practices and thinking of development practitioners. Information on our upcoming installments and archive videos of past presentations can be found on the webinar's page. If you're following us on Twitter, <clears throat> I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C Webinars. Our next webinar is going to be on February 25th, and our topic will be Understanding Behavior Change to Ensure Success, a really important topic. We'll be joined by Dr. Hans Hockey Mosler of EWAG, Valerie Cavan of Helvetas, and Laura <coughs> Schuler of COS. Check out the E4C professional development page for registration details. If you're already a member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinar directly. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see where everyone is from today. And this is a great opportunity for everyone to learn about our features, including the chat window. So in the chat window, I'd like to invite you, um, it's at the bottom right hand of your screen, to type in your location. I'll go ahead and get us started. So typing in my location. There we go. I see folks from Minnesota, from Cincinnati, Milwaukee, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, Maryland, lots of United States. Oh, Columbia. Just as I said, United States, we have someone join us from Columbia to prove me wrong. Uh, welcome, welcome, Seattle. Everyone is uh, joining us from all around the world and the United States today. So moving forward, uh, please use the chat window to type in any technical 
um, to take technical questions or administer problems. Feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin should you have any issues. You can also use the chat window to type in any remarks. However, during the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located directly below the chat, to type in your questions for the presenter. That will allow us to keep track. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the Q&A icon on the top right-hand corner. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to open WebEx up in a different browser. Following the webinar, to receive a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for this session, please follow the instructions on the top of a, the E4C professional development page. And the URL is listed right there. All right. Thank you so much. I see more folks have joined us from Haiti, India, Indiana. Uh, welcome, welcome all. Uh, so now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our today's presenter, Roberto Lunton is the founding executive director um, and the Robert Dari Chair of the Water for Food Institute at the University of Nebraska. He is also a professor of biological systems engineering at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Uh, he's a specialist in water resources and sustainable development with some 40 years of international experience in the field. Professor Lenton earned a civil engineering degree from the University of Buenos Aires and a PhD from MIT. He is the holder of an honorary LV from the University of Dundee. Before joining the University of Nebraska, Professor Lenton was the chair of the inspection panel of the World Bank. We're very honored to have you here, Professor Lenton, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Yana, that's a very nice introduction, um, and uh, welcome to everybody who is joining the webinar from all across the world. I was really excited to see so many people involved in so many different uh, parts of this globe. Um, so it's, uh, it's really an honor and a privilege for me to be able to share some thoughts with you uh, over the next uh, half an hour or so. Um, I, um, I guess my Overall, uh, talk is about uh, the subject of managing water for food security. Um, that's the focus of our institute. Um, and I want to sort of, sort of carry you through some of the main uh, issues that relate uh, to managing water for food security. I want to start with some overall context. Um, then. Um, say in a few words what I think are the main challenges of managing water for food security, um, and then go over to um, the issue of practical solutions with um, a special reference to, to four topics um, about closing agricultural and water productivity gaps, uh, about groundwater management, about irrigated agriculture, and about drought management that relate to, uh, to this challenge. Um, and then right at the end, I want to have just a few minutes uh, to talk about the Water for Food Institute itself. So that's uh, what I have in mind. Um, and just starting with the overall context, just to remind you of some overall statistics, I'm sure that you're familiar with most or if not all of these uh, statistics, but it's good to remind ourselves that we live uh, in a world in which uh, more than a billion people live in extreme poverty, um, and I, what I mean by that is less than $1.25 a day. Um, it's a world in which uh, almost, a million uh, almost a billion people, 870 million people, don't have enough food to eat. Um, it's a world in which over 1 billion people lack access to clean drinking water, uh, and over 2.5 billion lack ac uh, basic sanitation um, and it's a world in which, partly as a result of all of that, um, 165 million children under five are stunted um, as a result of chronic malnutrition. So it's a world where there are really serious problems of food security, of water security, uh, in the context of, of very poor and vulnerable uh, populations. Um, if we now... Uh, look at another side of the picture, um, it's uh, another statistic uh, that you're all familiar with is, is global population growth and the expectation that by the year 2050 we're going to have uh, 
uh, close to 9 billion people uh, on this planet. Um, and you're also familiar with the fact that most of that growth is going to be taking place uh, in the developing world, um, in particular in, uh, in Asia um, and Sub-Saharan Africa, 49% in Sub-Saharan Africa, 41% um, in, in Asia. So it's, uh, it's a world that is growing uh, in population uh, rapidly, um, but it's also a world where there is uh, significant good news, um, which is that uh, the progress that we've made um, in terms of reducing poverty over the last uh, 25 years has really been dramatic. Um, and uh, even people are talking about the end of poverty as illustrated by this cover story uh, in The Economist. So it's clearly a, a, a world where we have made significant progress, um, where poverty levels as defined, or where absolute poverty levels as defined by the $1.25 uh, figure a day um, has decreased significantly. Um, and uh, the impact that that has, of course, is that with rising incomes, uh, people are able to um, allocate more of their incomes uh, to food for their families, um, and that's going to result um, in better diets, um, more caloric intake, um, and that um, uh, has increasing pressure in terms of food supply. So the good news actually translates into additional challenges uh, as regards food supplies. Um, and be behind all of this, uh, or better said, uh, accompanying all of these changes um, is, of course, uh, climate change. And although many times we, uh, the concept of climate change is depicted by the, uh, the you know, the, the, the melting of the Arctic and and things uh, uh, illustrated by this polar bear. Um, one thing to keep in to in, keep in mind is that much of climate change is actually felt through uh, changes in the water regime, changes uh, in the hydrological cycle, um, more uh, extremes of uh, of floods and droughts, um, and. Uh, and even rising sea levels have, has an impact uh, on fresh water because of the fact that it leads to salinity intrusion uh, in coastal areas. So much of the impacts of climate change are felt in, but through changes in the hydrological water cycle. And so it has a particular significance when we're talking about water and food security. Um, so let's, uh, from that overall con context, let's move in more specifically into the uh, particular challenges of managing water for food security. Um, and I like uh, starting out uh, by describing it um, in terms of how can one uh, attain uh, global food security that is sustainable but obtain it in the face of increasing competition for scarce water resources. So um, the two issues of water security and food security are interconnected in this way. Um, and um, I like to think of it, and I think this is, is, uh, is something important to emphasize, that it's not uh, simply a technical issue of, of growing more food, um, but it has all kinds of political, environmental, social, and, and economic repercussions. And that's what makes it so challenging, um, but also what makes it uh, so interesting. So maybe the best way to start out is to think, um, what do we mean by the concept of water security and, and by the concept of food security? Um, and for water security, I like thinking of it in terms of this definition that uh, was developed by David Gray and Claudia Sadoff some years back, um, and they defined it in terms of the reliable availability of an acceptable quantity and quality of water for health, livelihoods, and production, coupled with an acceptable level of water-related risks. Um, and, uh, and these figures here illustrated on the left-hand side clearly uh, water um, for uh, essentially for productive purposes for livelihood generations, um, as illustrated by uh, 
that uh, irrigated farm. Um, on the right-hand side, water for food, uh, water for, for health, um, as illustrated by the water that we need to consume daily uh, <coughs> for drinking and for other domestic purposes. Um, and in the middle, reminding ourselves that water security is not simply a question of accessing water, but also dealing with water-related risks, um, and that's primarily uh, flooding. Where So what we have to think about in terms of water security is not only accessing water for, for productive or purposes or for meeting human needs, but also uh, addressing um, water-related risks. Um, and as the last thing I would say about this definition is that it emphasizes not only quantity of water, but the appropriate quality. So in, whenever we're talking about water, we have to think of those two uh, dimensions. Now, turning to food security, um, I like the definition, um, the simple definition of food security as simply being when everyone everywhere has access to enough safe and nutritious food for a healthy um, and active life. Um, and uh, I think there's general recognition that food security uh, rests on three pillars. One is the availability of food. You can't have food security if, water is not, if, if food is not available. Um, but it also means access to food, um, principally economic access to food. So even if food is available, if people don't have the income to be able to uh, to access uh, that food, there will be no food security. Um, and the third is the use of food, how food is treated so that it is actually uh, safe and nutritious, uh, which is an important part of the, uh, of the definition. Um, and one thing that I would emphasize here is that water um, is important in all of these three pillars. Water is important not only in the food production process in ensuring availability on the left-hand side, so we not only need to have water in order to be able to, uh, to grow food, but we also need to recognize the role of water in overall economic development um, and in the generation of life, livelihoods um, that enables uh, food access. So water has an important role in the second pillar. Um, and on the third, um, it's really important if you're going to be able to uh, produce, uh, if, 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 if in the household there is to be safe and nutritious food, it's very important that there be clean water that can be used for cooking um, and that uh, the drinking water that, uh, that people um, use is safe um, so that you don't have a situation of diarrheal diseases that then uh, negate, uh, that produce loss of calories and negate the, uh, the positive impacts of nutritious food. So, so water um, is important to all three pillars uh, of food security. Um, the, uh, in terms of the actual production of food, um, I like to think of um, the overall uh, challenge um, as advancing food security with less pressure on scarce water resources. Um, and one can see the challenges uh, that that entails by looking at what is happening, uh, happening both uh, in the food area and in the water area. And this slide here tries to depict uh, green on the left and, and, and blue on the right, what, what are the trends that we see. And both, on both sides, we see trends going in, the wor in, in, a, in, a, in opposite directions, in worrying directions. On the food side, we see uh, increasing uh, global consumption, um, uh, primarily as a result not only of population growth, but rising incomes and changing diets, as I was explaining earlier. Uh, we do see constraints in terms of expansion in cropland. Um, we also see changes in land use, uh, not, not only land degradation, uh, but also the use of land for non-food crops, uh, in particular biofuels. We see in many parts of the world uh, that yield increases that have been quite steady over the years are reaching a plateau. Um, and then finally, we're seeing uh, the impacts of climate change uh, 
that affect um, just uh, the the, uh, the, uh, the ability to be able to produce crops in certain uh, in certain parts of the world. So that's on the left hand side on the food front. On the water front, we see also varying uh, very worrying signs in terms primarily of increasing competition by other water users, uh, people, and industry. Um, and these other water users um, are uh, increasing uh, at much more than a linear uh, scale. We're seeing many parts of the world where even right now, environmental water needs are not met. Um, we see decreasing quality um, as well as quantity, principally as a result of pollution, um, and, and, and not only in rural areas, but also in, not only in urban areas, but also in rural areas as a result of agricultural intensification. Uh, we do see uh, soil erosion and deteriorating soil health, and when we have uh, unhealthy soils, that leads to uh, poorer water management. We see groundwater depletion uh, in many parts of the world, and I'll come back to that later on. Um, and again, as with food, we see the big impacts of climate change, uh, emphasizing the point I made earlier that the changes in climate are uh, experienced through changes uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the water regime. Um, so now let me turn to uh, the practical solutions. Uh, what can we do about this? Sometimes when one outlines problems of, of these, the challenges of these salt, you think, well, what can we be done? It's so complicated, so, uh, so difficult to tackle. Um, and one, one way to start um, is to uh, describe the, the problem primarily, primarily of, of, as one of doing more with less, that we have to be able to figure out ways in which we can produce more food uh, with less pressure on water resources. And I use the term less pressure on water resources because I want to emphasize it's not only using less water, but it's having less a, of, a, of an adverse impact on water quality. So the overall challenge is one of doing more with less. Um, and, and the solutions there relate uh, always to um, how can you uh, figure out innovations that uh, improve water productivity. Water productivity is the ratio between what is produced um, uh, from the water, what the amount of food that is produced, um, and the water that is consumed. So we want to find, figure out ways uh, to develop technological and other innovations to improve water productivity. Um, and these these uh, four pictures depict the kinds of innovations that one can think of. On the, on the top left-hand side, um, there's certainly innovations in agricultural technology that can uh, improve water productivity. Um, and uh, as just as an example, a uh, drought-tolerant crops. On the right-hand side, there's the uh, innovations in irrigation technology um, that, uh, that we're all familiar with, uh, be it uh, center pivot irrigation, as in this figure here, or in drip irrigation, or other ways in which one can um, make sure that um, that uh, one maximizes the productivity from from the water that is applied. On the lower left hand side is a is a soil moisture uh, sensor as an example of the kinds of technologies uh, of information technologies that can really improve water productivity, and this is perhaps the area with the fastest growth in, in recent years, uh, the ability that we now have to be able to use information technology to improve productivity. Um, and a lot of it has to do to be able to measure how much water there is uh, in the soil so that any additional water that we, we might apply uh, is minimized. Um, and on the bottom right-hand corner, I wanted to emphasize that this also that the concept of improving water productivity should look be looked at across the whole food chain um so no, not only at the at the farm end but all the way from farm to fork um and there are innovations that can be made in food processing in beverage in the, in the food and beverage industry and other industries in terms of using less water um so that's clearly um uh an important 
way of moving forward is looking at ways in which we can improve water productivity. Um, but I'd like to emphasize that uh, it can't only be on the, uh, in terms of producing more food with less water. Uh, as many people have emphasized, uh, reducing food waste needs to be a part of the solution um, because the, the less food we, uh, we waste, uh, intrinsically that means the less water we waste. Every time we waste food, we're also wasting the water that went into producing it. So reducing food waste needs to be a part of the solution. But I'd like to uh, emphasize that this isn't necessarily low-hanging fruit. Um, it's not a panacea, um, as this uh, PowerPoint illustrates the, uh, the causes um, differ in, uh, from region to region. Um, it's much closer to the consumer end uh, in places of the world like Europe and North America um, and industrialized Asia. That's, uh, there's much more waste closer to the consumer um, than at the production end. But in other parts of the world, in sub-Saharan Africa, in South and Southeast Asia, in Latin America, a lot of it is, uh, of the food that is wasted is at the production to retailing end. Um, and uh, in both cases, this presents challenges. When it's close to the consumer, it really implies huge challenges in terms of behavior change. When it's closer to the production end, it requires investments, significant investments uh, in reducing food waste at that end. Uh, which, again, is not easy. So it has to be part of the solution, but it can't be the only part of the solution. Um, and the other thing I would emphasize is that international trade clearly uh, plays a role. Um, uh, water specialists like to talk about virtual water, which is the water that is embedded in food that is exported or imported. Um, and there is quite a lot of import and export or an export of virtual water that is happening right now. So clearly, international trade where, water, where food is produced in countries with abundant water um, and exported to countries with scarce water seems to make sense, but we should all recognize that uh, international trade is governed by uh, all kinds of other factors, um, and uh, is, it's, it, it's hard to isolate the, the, the water dimension from the other uh, important drivers, uh, or the most important drivers of uh, international uh, trade in food products. So let me now go into the, those areas that I mentioned earlier that um, I wanted to spend a bit of time uh, looking at. Um, and the first has to do with closing agricultural and water productivity gaps. Um, the concept of yield gaps is, is uh, is fairly easy to explain. Um, we have for every plot of land uh, anywhere in the world um, and for any given crop, there is clearly a, a yield potential that is governed by agronomic factors and climatic factors and so on. Um, in addition, uh, it, it, from a practical point of view, um, it's virtually impossible for uh, one to always get that full potential. So maybe there's a 75 to 85 percent of the yield potential is the actually the attainable yield. Um, and then there's the actual average farm yield, um, which is what farmers are uh, producing today on average uh, in that particular area in relation to uh, the yield that is uh, attainable. Um, and the yield gap, uh, the exploitable yield gap, is the difference between that average farm yield um, and, uh, and the attainable yield. Um, and in most parts of the world, um, there is a yield gap uh, that is exploitable, um, but the amount uh, and the size of that yield gap uh, varies considerably. Um, and here's just an example um, of a yield gap um, in Tanzania, Kenya and Ethiopia, um, a mapping of what those yield gaps are, um, and I'll come back to this later on um, again, but, uh, but it illustrates that there are big differences between uh, different uh, parts of even these three countries. In some areas, a very large uh, 
uh, yield gap, uh, in this is in the case of maize, up to six tons per hectare. Um, in other areas, uh, a fairly small yield gap. But in the end, that's part of what we have to do is to uh, is to reduce that yield gap uh, to the extent that we possibly can, taking into account that uh, there is not that much potential for expanding uh, cultivated area. Now, the same can be uh, uh, said uh, in terms of water productivity gaps. Um, and uh, we have here in, in, uh, at the University of Nebraska an agricultural water management network where uh, farmers are working with uh, research, uh, researchers and extension technologies to uh, develop, uh, ex extension uh, agents to develop uh, technologies that can be used on the field that will actually reduce water withdrawals um, and uh, um, by re reducing water withdrawal you improve the water productivity at the field level. Um, and this has been a very exciting activity, a growing number of farmers uh, joining uh, in this effort um, that actually reduces their costs um, at the same time as improving uh, water productivity. But one thing I would want to emphasize is that it's all very tricky because uh, one has to be very careful about uh, in assessing the results of these kinds of experiments. Clearly there is a yield impact um, with uh, these improved uh, technologies. Um, and as I said earlier, there's a water impact that is the reduction in water withdrawals. Uh, but a reduction in water withdrawals at the farm level doesn't necessarily translate into net water savings at the watershed level. Um, so one has to be very careful about that because um, uh, very often you're tempted when you say, oh, you can, you can improve irrigation efficiency significantly, and that sounds as though one can um, get uh, big improvements uh, in terms of, of net water savings, but some of the water that is being saved would have returned to the aquifer anyway, um, and so that the amount that is saved at the aquifer level, at the watershed level, uh, is significantly lower than what would appear to be uh, in terms of the reductions in water withdrawals at the at the farm level. So these issues of water productivity are complex and have to be looked at uh, carefully. Um, the next issue I wanted to touch on is on sustainable groundwater management because that's a challenge uh, in many parts of the world. Um, here is an example uh, from the World Resources Institute of India's groundwater uh, tables and how they are decreasing. 54% of wells are decreasing um, in terms of, of uh, the, the, the depth uh, to, to, uh, to groundwater. Um, and as you can see from this graph, the situation is the most serious in the northwest, but other parts of the country are also facing uh, particularly in, uh, in the in the central area and towards the south, are also facing uh, significant levels of groundwater decrease. Um, and it is a global phenomenon around the world that you um, that uh, there's very very little good news um, in most parts of the world. You see groundwater decreasing, and here's an example uh, from the United States of the High Plains Aquifer in the most fertile and, and in the heartland of the country, high productivity areas, you see that aquifer uh, also facing significant uh, reductions uh, in, in, uh, in decreases in, in the water table uh, over the last several decades, particularly the further um, uh, south you go. Now, I said earlier that there's almost no good news, um, but there is one piece of good news, which is the northern part of the aquifer um, that has faced uh, relatively small amounts of groundwater decrease. Um, and I'm giving that as an example because the, uh, the uh, reason why this is the case, um, let me see if I can change the slide, is... Uh, in my view, uh, partly the result of uh, 
good groundwater recharge um, in the state of Nebraska, and and uh, so there's 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 the, just the good fortune of being able to recharge the the aquifer naturally. But um, as important a factor is good groundwater governance, um, and I'd like to emphasize that because when you're talking about groundwater sustainability, in the end, it boils down to governance. Um, and in the case of Nebraska, the uh, the difference was made by a far-reaching decision over 40 years ago to uh, establish natural resource districts that have local control uh, over groundwater management. So these are local authorities, local elected bodies that control water um, at a very local level um, and have had in my view, a hugely important uh, role in terms of groundwater governance um, and in protecting the aquifer, and that's the sort of the the the, the good news in that uh, generally very uh, depressing um, story of groundwater uh, sustainability across the globe. Um, one aspect of all this, and that's why it's so important to talk about local authorities, is that in the end, Farmers have a hugely important role in managing water. Um, it's, it's clearly, uh, they are the ones who directly manage 70% of the world's water. It's, uh, so um, you can't think of managing water only in terms of water agencies and uh, government bureaucracies and so on. In the end, it's farmers um, and local authorities uh, where farmers have a really important role uh, have to be an important part of the of the solution. Let me move on to drought management, uh, a really uh, critical subject um, across the globe. Uh, over the last year, we've been uh, all heard about uh, the droughts in in southern Brazil, the droughts in California. Um, increasingly, there's always a, a, some spot around the world that is. Uh, in the middle of a drought, and so it's a really important issue to be able to deal with. Um, one aspect of dealing with drought is the ability to be able to monitor drought, um, and we do have uh, here um, in the uh, uh, at our university the National Drought uh, Monitoring Center that essentially uh, releases every week uh, a uh, a picture uh, of drought uh, emerging or uh, in different parts of, of the country. Um, and so that's a source of really important information that can be used by uh, decision makers to be able to develop appropriate responses. This, this particular map was produced in the middle of a, the most serious recent drought, which was in 2012. And these kinds, kinds of uh, tools are more and more available uh, around the world. So clearly, the ability to be able to monitor drought and get the up-to-date information is really significant. Um, the other side of it is, is water management, um, because in the end, the ability to, to weather a drought has to do with um, how water is, is, uh, is managed, um, and particularly, uh, storage, um, because in the end, that it is it is storage that enable enables us to deal with with temporary scarcity. It allows us to capture the resource when it is abundant um, and use it when it is scarce. Um, and I like to think of storage not only in terms of physical storage but also virtual storage. Um, and when I say v virtual. Uh, water storage, um, um, I'm thinking, for example, of food storage, because you're storing uh, what is produced by water. So when we're talking about uh, storage and the ability to cope, uh, let's think of it uh, in, this broader, in this broader sense. Um, and one way of looking at, uh, at, at this, uh, just expanding what I just said, um, it, it, it's clearly one should look at the different kinds of water storage, reservoirs, groundwater, soil moisture, look at food storage, uh, the virtual water storage that I was talking about earlier. But um, I would also include in that management strategies, um, uh, drought or flood insurance, water sharing agreements. Those, um, in, a, in a broader sort of virtual sense, uh, 
also uh, allow us to uh, cope uh, with extremes. Um, and so a drought management strategy has to encompass uh, these various different elements. Um, and uh, the, uh, the last thing I would say on this topic um, is that when one is thinking of water storage, really important not only to think about uh, the built uh, storage, but also the natural storage. Um, and in many parts of the world, the natural storage is as important as the built storage. So the built storage would include uh, reservoirs, for example, um, but the natural uh, storage often includes uh, ponds and tanks. It includes, of course, aquifers. Um, it includes soil moisture, it includes natural wetlands. All these are, um, are essentially what nature provides us for free. Um, so in thinking about drought management, we should think about the, uh, the reservoirs that can be built, uh, but also we should be looking at what nature allows us, provides for us, uh, essentially for free if we govern it uh, properly. Um, let me move on to the what I think was the last of the, the, the topics that I had singled out for special attention, um, and that is uh, irrigation. Um, and it's a, a really uh, a changing context. Um, and irrigation, irrigation is probably the most obvious example of managing water for food security. Um, and it's, it's a changing context because uh, if you look at uh, this uh, chart that was developed with World Bank and, and FAO data, um, you can see that there were a couple of decades uh, from between 1970 and 1990, particularly between the early 70s and the late 80s, um, where, which were the heyday of, uh, of, of irrigation development, um, and irrigation was being expanded all over the world. But that pace of irrigation development has slowed down uh, considerably. This uh, diagram only goes up to 2005, but the picture hasn't changed very much in terms of overall irrigation development. So it's a changing, it's a changing world. Um, and the one area where perhaps one would be looking for in the future for uh, potential uh, expansion um, is in sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at it, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, there's a, a less than 5% of cultivated land is irrigated as opposed to 20% in Asia, and I believe it's around 10% in Latin America. So it's, it's, it's really, really lagging, um, and many people argue that you can't really have a green revolution in Africa without the same kind of investments uh, in, in um in irrigation. Um, so here's a, a continent where there are, uh, if you take out, if you just look at sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, rel water resources are relatively abundant, uh, and yet there's very small amounts of irrigated agriculture. So if there's any part of the world where there is potential, um, it's in sub-Saharan Africa, and to a lesser extent in Latin America, um, where you have a similar situation of relatively abundant water resources and relatively low levels of irrigation investment so far. So that's one dimension of the change. Um, the other dimension of the change is that because of the cost of irrigated agriculture and irrigation, we're going to see much more the use of irrigation uh, in terms of higher value crops, more profitability, much more emphasis on, on, uh, on, on you know, the high value uh, crops. Um, and in keeping with what I was saying, much more emphasis on reducing water use um, in getting more crop per drop. So that's going to be a large part of, the, uh, of what we will be seeing in the future. So I, I promised earlier to end with some uh, quick uh, description of what our institute uh, does because we are in the middle of this challenge of, of uh, managing water for food security. Um, we were established in 2010 uh, with a gift uh, from the Robert B. Doughty Charitable Foundation. Um, and uh, our vision is a food and water secure world um, in which global food security is ensured, but without uh, compromising the use of water to meet other pressing needs. So that's the overall uh, business that, that we're in um, and what
what drives our work. Um, and we have identified over the last uh, <clears throat> few years uh, five areas where we feel we can make a difference. And these are areas that are relevant both uh, to the, um, the developing world um, and in it's also relevant to areas of high productivity um, in countries like uh, United States or Canada or Australia or Argentina or Brazil. Um, so the, both the, uh, the, the, the food exporting countries as well as the uh, more uh, vulnerable uh, uh, developing countries. Um, and the five areas are closing agricultural uh, productivity gaps, uh, groundwater management for agricultural production, uh, enhancing high productivity irrigated agriculture, uh, agroecosystems and public health, um, and the management of agricultural drought, which we do together with the National Drought Mitigation Center, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, just some examples of the work that we're engaged in. Um, in Tanzania, we are involved in a pilot project uh, together with a private company, uh, Valmont Irrigation, um, and an NGO, World Vision. Um, and the idea there is how can the benefits of uh, center pivot irrigation that have uh, mainly been used for large-scale commercial agriculture in Africa, how can those be brought uh, to benefit smallholders? So we're looking at uh, ways in which of social organizations so that uh, the, uh, the, the huge benefits in terms of increased uh, productivity and increased incomes can be brought uh, to bear to, uh, with, with smallholders. So that's one example of the kind of collaborative public-private uh, partnership that we're involved in. Um, another example is the Global Yield Gap and Water Productivity Atlas, and I was um, mentioning earlier that map that was in, produced in, in Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Kenya. Well, that was produced by this Global Yield Gap and Water Productivity Atlas, which is a collaboration between um, a group of faculty here at the University of Nebraska, um, as well as with in Wageningen University um, in, uh, in the Netherlands, supported by the, the Gates Foundation. Um, education is very much a part, uh, part of our mandate. We have a dual degree program with the uh, uh, Institute of Water Education in the Netherlands, and, st and students study uh, for one year in the Netherlands and a second year here in Nebraska and end up with uh, degrees from both places, um, and we also have an active program of internships and fellowships for both undergraduate and graduate students um, and postdocs. Um, and then finally, we do have uh, an annual Water for Food Global Conference because we feel very strongly that in the end, one has to have uh, engage with stakeholders uh, through policy dialogues based on solid uh, research, um, and so we do have an annual uh, conference that uh, really brings together stakeholders from a number of countries around the world, um, and uh, not only academics, but practitioners, producers, government agencies, uh, policymakers. So it's a very exciting uh, annual event that we uh, that we organize. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Um, this is just a, a small little advertisement for our next conference, which is uh, on April 24 to 26. Um, and it's going to uh, focus on what we call catalytic collaborations, uh, building public-private partnerships for water and food security. Um, so that's uh, the, uh, the uh, main things I wanted to share with you. And again, thanks for your attention, and I'd be happy to uh, uh, spend some time in addressing any questions that you might have. Thank you, Roberto. That was an incredibly rich uh, presentation with uh, so much insight, and we're super excited to hear some questions from our attendees. There's been some chatter already happening amongst them. They seem to be uh, commenting um, to one another. So I'd like to invite uh, those with questions to submit them via the Q&A window, um, and we have some coming in. 
So um, the first question we have, and it's actually one that I was also thinking, is I know you've presented quite a few approaches, but uh, could you speak to a couple uh, specific examples or what are some of the promising innovations that you've seen in, the technolo in technology that improves water productivity? Um, yeah, I, I guess um, some, uh, some of the most uh, promising um, are in fact not necessarily rocket science. Uh, some of the most promising uh, innovations, I think, um, have um, are the result of, of low-cost technologies that then led to uh, significant rates of adoption, um, mm. and and that really is uh, an important thing to. Uh, take into account the you know the bamboo tube well in South Asia uh, in the 70s and 80s huge huge uh, impact um, because it was low cost and and enabled um, a large uh, sig and significant adoption um, and I think the, uh, <clears throat> the 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 use of low lift pumps in sub-Saharan Africa um, has also had a hugely significant uh, adoption rate. Um, chatting to a colleague recently um, with a group called Kickstart, um, they have sold something like 250,000 low lift pumps across uh, sub Saharan Africa, and, and you can just see the, the impact that something like that could have. So, so I think um, uh, the general category of low lift. Uh, low lift, well, I wouldn't say low lift, but low cost um, irrigation technologies, I think, is is really significant. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, I would say that the the real revolution in terms of uh, precision agriculture um, and data intensive approaches that allow farmers um, to be able to tailor the amount of water uh, to the specific requirements at a very, of the crop at a very localized level so that you can take into account um, you know, minute variations in terrain and so on um, so that the amount of water applied responds to the requirement of the crop taking into account soil moisture and so on, um, again, has, has huge implications. Um, and uh, it's essentially science-based farming. And we were chatting yesterday with a group of farmers here from Nebraska that have adopted these kinds of techniques. And, and uh, um, <clears throat> it essentially means that rather than simply apply water when the crop looks as though it needs it, um, it means applying water uh, based on a scientific understanding of how much the water the, the crop actually needs. Um, and it can re it can result in absolutely uh, in in huge uh, reductions in the amount of water that is applied. So I think those are some examples at the two ends of the spectrum of innovations that um, are uh, done in in practice. Those are really sound examples, and, and, and you mentioned uh, some of these low-cost pumps, and i uh, just like to let the audience know that we actually have cataloged a number of such low-cost pumps within our solutions library for anybody who's looking for examples. Uh, we have the Kickstart that we featured amongst others, so uh, I really do appreciate you noting those. Um, uh, I think uh, you, that low-cost aspect is quite critical. And we have a comment here uh, from one of our attendees uh, who notes that in addition to the current innovations, um, where is the value benefit for farmers? And you talk about farmers having that 70% control of water. Uh, where is uh, the uh, value benefit for farmers to adopt such technologies who may have limited investment budgets? So um, if you could speak to uh, that particular challenge. Yeah. That's uh, and that's where the uh, the policy environment is so important. Um, it uh, very often the the value benefit for farmers um, is uh, the reduction in energy costs. Um, mm -hmm. in, in most in most countries, um, it's it's not a reduction in the water cost because um, that. Uh, is not 
a significant element um, in, in, in many contexts, but the value benefit can be a reduction in energy costs um, as well as whatever yield gains uh, the technology produces. So you have, um, if you're going from from a uh, less efficient to a more efficient uh, system of irrigation, you can reduce your energy costs. But again, that depends very much on the policy environment and the system that is used um, uh, in terms of payment for energy services. Absolutely, and definitely, and we know there's quite a lot of chatter in the field regarding the water food energy nexus. Uh, right. because it, it's one that's so inextricably linked. Um, another question that we have here is, would manually or cattle-operated machinery be viable, a viable alternative, um, oh, sorry, just lost my question, um, for powering up more efficient irrigation practices? So manual or cattle-operated machinery as an alternative. Any thoughts on that? Um, the... The thing to, uh, I mean, I, I guess I would say that the overall point um, is 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 a valid one that um, that manually operated that when one thinks about different technologies and and uh, and so on for improving mm -hmm. uh, the use of water, you you should also include manual uh approaches the thing to keep in mind um on the manual side is the energy balance um mm -hmm. and the uh you know the, the the amount of of labor um and energy and calories that go into uh that uh then offset the benefits that the technology might might produce so whenever the, uh one talks about manually operated uh, technology, you really have to look at the energy balance um, and the caloric, uh, I guess, uh, usage that that entails. Yes, indeed, that's that's a very good point. And I think we we have one more question that is turning us to look at uh, farming techniques. And in this case, the question is, can you speak to the impact that? conservation farming has had on food and water security? And is there a method that is seen as making strides towards better security? So conservation farming. Great, well, thank you very much. That really is is an important uh, question. Um, and there's, there's no uh, doubt in my mind that conservation farming has a huge impact in terms of the use of water uh, in agriculture, um, because uh, one of the objectives of conservation farming is to be able to, um, you know, to conserve uh, soil moisture, to conserve whatever um, water is available that the crop that the crop can use. So, making sure that any water that falls um, uh, is retained and can be used for crop production rather than running off. Um, and into streams and uh, and and elsewhere. Um, so it, it it is a really important part of the equation. Um, and I think some of the uh, the the data that uh, that we have is that it's one of the most effective ways of reducing uh, water use. Um, I, it relates to a point that I was making earlier about healthy soils. Uh, the health the healthier the soil is, the more it is able to retain water, um, and the more it is able to retain water, the more uh, the crop can access that water uh, for crop uh, production purposes. Absolutely, and I'm going to take one last question, and I think it's it's uh, still quite tied to the topic of conservation farming. Um, in this case, uh, the question is regarding um, storage of resources and banking for future use when in high demand storage of water. Um, the question is, is there movement and progress in the political environment allowing such storage devices as rain catchments? What was the last uh, part of, of the question? I, I, is there movement? 
Sure. Uh, so the question is about storage devices such as rain catchment systems and whether there is m progress in the political sphere uh, for really supporting uh, those kinds of devices to be utilized in the farming setting, uh, rain catchment systems and other types of storage for water. Right. Great question again, um, because the uh, you know so much of the all the secret um, here is how to be able to uh, to capture water before um, and avoid its its runoff. So that is is clearly uh, has to be a part of the equation. Um, and in terms of the movement on the political sphere, I think that. Um, it, it varies. Uh, I think too much of the discussion around storage tends to be around large uh, infrastructure um, and uh, and not much attention uh, to some of the more local uh, systems to capture rainwater and so on. Um, so the the political debate is often dominated by the larger systems, um, whereas uh, in in practice some of the uh, these other smaller systems at more local scales can have huge impacts. One really uh, good example that I think of, of policies that work um, uh, is, uh, is in India where um, in Chennai um, there is essentially it's the, the incentives for building rainwater catchment systems have been built into, um, if I understand it correctly, into the housing code. So whenever you want uh, if you want to have uh, access to water from the mains, you have to install a rainwater catchment system so that water that you, which essentially means that, that uh, the rainwater then will recharge the, uh, uh, the, the aquifer. So I think that you do have some, some important experiments um, and, uh, and movement in the political arena towards these kinds of, of smaller uh, systems to capture rain, but much more is uh, is needed. That is really interesting, and I think a good inspirational note for us to end on. Um, it's I couldn't agree more that uh, solutions that are viable at the local scale really have tremendous potential. Uh, part of the rationale for us uh, engineering for change, capturing all of these kinds of um, products and services is to encourage more uh, ideas around those kinds of solutions and certainly policy has a tremendous role to play. Um, we are at time and I would like to thank you Roberto for, for sharing with us all of these insightful ideas and, and uh, giving us some food for thought, uh, if you will. And I'd like to thank all of you out there for attending today's webinar. Uh, for those of you who are seeking to receive your professional development hours, please uh, do reach out with a code that is listed on the slide in front of you. Uh, we apologize that we couldn't get to everyone's questions. There's no questions that have come in, but uh, if you really have a burning question, please feel free to email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org and we'd be happy to pass them on. And don't forget to become an E4C member to get information on our upcoming webinars. Thank you, everyone. Have a great morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you may be, and we will catch you on the next E4C webinar. Take care.